Dame Natalie Massanet is a visionary and a very inspiring woman. It is not by chance that her latest project is called Imaginary Ventures. As a woman of power and success, Natalie still believes in the power of making dreams come true and following the heart of her imagination. Born to an English mother and an American father, Natalie spent her first years in Paris and then moved to Los Angeles at the age of 11. She studied English literature there before taking on a string of different jobs like modeling in Japan or being a receptionist. She began her career as a journalist at WWD and then went on to work for Tatler UK where she met and worked for the legendary Isabella Blow. She decided to go freelance in 1998 and that's when the entrepreneur in her became alive. She was an early believer in the possibilities of selling fashion and luxury online. In 2000, she started net a -Porter, and the rest is history. She left her role as executive chairman of the group net a -Porter after it merged with Ux in September 2015. That decision opened so many more doors for her career. Natalie, in fact, went on to become chairman of the British Fashion Council and then non-executive co-chairman or Farfetch. And last but not least, she was made a Dame of the Order of the British Empire in 2016. It is my great pleasure to welcome Dame Natalie Massonet to show studio Showbiz. Hi Natalie. Hi Nima. Thank you so much for being here. Um, it means so a lot to us. It's amazing to be here. It's my first time in uh, Nick's studio actually. You've never come to Shostu before? No, no, it's such a treat. Uh, it's beautiful. It reminds me of um, the artist studio that we started Neta Porte in, in 1999. That's fantastic. Beautiful space. Great, so great omen for our chat. So <laughs> since we said it reminds me of 1999, that's what I would like to start from. Um, but instead of talking really about Neta Porte, I would like to talk about the seed of an idea. So one day you wake up and you say, that's it. I believe in this, I want to do it. Is it reckless boldness? Is it courage? Is it, is it more difficult now that you know it all? Well, I mean, I think if, uh, if I'd known um, what it entailed and the journey I was going to go through, I would have probably sat down and thought about it a little bit longer. Um, I think whenever you have an idea to do something, um, I think you just focus on the first steps, not necessarily the entire journey. And, um, and the, I mean, there was a lot of naiveness involved in saying I can do something like this. But um, I first wanted to uh, do net a -Porte, not because I wanted to launch a business, but because I wanted to show others that they could um, sell product online. And um, as a journalist at the time, I thought that this was and an obvious uh, gift for retailers and for brands to be able to um, have one location that you could distribute to the world. And uh, in conversations with friends who had businesses, uh, it was clear that um, it was an early idea and people weren't ready for it. And I said, okay, well, I'll show you how to do it. And then you guys take the baton and run. Um, but as it turned out, you know, I've, fell in love with doing it. And, but I'd, I didn't sit down and think I'm going to build a you know, billion dollar business. And well, I guess you didn't sit down and think about the billion dollar business, but you didn't think about it as a business at all? I mean, from oh. day two, you've got bills to pay and money to make, no? No, I, I, I did think about it as a business um, and immediately surrounded myself with very talented people, smart people. Um, I mean, there was never a point at which we weren't going to do it perfectly or within the, the realm of what we could deliver that would be perfect. Um, and you know, sometimes that involves compromise, but um, no, we were ambitious and, yeah. um, and we took it very seriously. Um, but I'm sure from the outside, it looked like it was um, everything built on a wing and a prayer. But um, you know, there was never a day where we didn't focus on the tiny detail and the big picture. Well, I want to make sure I, I never thought that. And I imagine it like, you know, 
let's start a business, let's rent a place, let's, you know, raise some money. Yeah. But I've listened to most of your interviews and read whatever I could find from you and about you. And I had the feeling that it was just what you said, you know, I thought I need to show the world that that was possible. And you also said somewhere that someone called you that silly girl with that silly idea or something like that. So you had to knock at doors of brands. How did they receive you? Well, the, the people who participated and who were supportive from day one obviously thought it was genius and um, were very excited for this to come to fruition. Um, interestingly, the, the first two people to come on board who believed in it were two women, two business owners in the fashion space, mothers, who understood that fashion needed to come to you and you didn't have to be the one to go to fashion. And that was Tamara Mellon, uh, when she was just uh, in the early bursts of success with Jimmy Choo and Anya Heinmarch. Mm, fantastic. I didn't know about Anya being on board from the beginning. Yeah, it was uh, one of the first people that I called and said, hey, I'm doing this thing. Um, it's going to be like a fashion magazine. You'll be able to click on the pictures and buy it and have it delivered wherever you are in the world. And she said, OK. <laughs> and I said, are you sure? And she said, sure. And I said, OK, we better do this now. <laughs> Fantastic. And did you have to go through the painful process of writing a business plan and all of those things, or you, you asked for help? Um, well, both. Um, you, I wrote a business plan. I wrote the business plan two or three times and fine-tuned it, and, uh, and I asked for help at every step of the way. I think um, you have to, uh, in order to go where you're going to go, you need to know where you're going. And part of knowing where you're going is um, setting it out in a plan, um, how you're going to do it, um, who's going to help you do it, how much money it's going to cost to build it, and um, how long is it going to take? And then especially if you're going to raise money from other people. If it's your own money, you know, perhaps you can be a bit less structured, although I think structure obviously helps. Yeah. But if you're going to raise money from other people, you have a covenant with them which says, I'm going to do this. If you give me this, then you, know, you should be repaid handsomely. And, Which they um, all did, by the way. <laughs> people did all right. Yeah, yeah people did all right. And <laughs> there, there's, I believe in karma, and I think there's a lot of good karma coming, coming to you. Oh, well, I don't know. I think we put a lot of heart into it, and people wanted us to succeed. Um, we had, uh, I mean, for such a long time, people were really cheerleading and um, helping, and there's so much goodwill. I mean, the, the magazines, I mean, for we, we had uh, very little uh, marketing budget, and we relied on uh, the amazing press that we received around the world from people who loved fashion and magazines and blogs, and um, they really uh, lifted us. So it was incredible. And you must have noticed the difference between the fact that now you're Natalie Massonet and maybe you, you know, pick the phone and people listen more than when before this time it was more, it was harder to be I was sorry I was on the other side because I had started my job at Gucci Group yes and it was 2005 and I remember having long meetings to discuss if our brands were going to go yeah. into that and I think about that now like that's science fiction you know that's a no now everybody wants to be there. So. I think people were very nervous about putting their brand on what up until then was uh, seen as a mass market uh, conveyor -luxury, belt. Yeah. Non and it was. It was a non-luxury uh, space. But I think uh, every platform can be whatever it is uh, depending on who uses the platform. Photography, for example, can be elevated and it can be uh, amateurish. Um, uh, yeah. Television can be uh, uh, base and uh, you know comedy, and uh, or it can be inspiring documentaries, uh, film, the same thing. Um, the internet is the same thing. Even down to people's Instagram accounts, yeah. you can have uh, uh, completely different tones. And I think people were throwing out the platform. Uh, because of the way it had been used in the past without considering how they could use it. And I think that's one of the things that 
was an amazing lesson for me then to see that people could be so closed-minded to something that could be a tool for their businesses. Um, and we're going to do it again. We're going to keep doing it. Um, although I think people now realize with the pace of adoption and how quickly we are uh, as consumers and as businesses seeing change, people now are probably saying, you know, oh, OK, should I experiment with this thing over here? Um, probably. I can't ignore anything anymore. And I need to go where the consumer is experimenting. Um, so I'm not sure that what happened in, in 2000 will happen again. I think people will be more open-minded. Yeah, they will be more open-minded, but changes and trends also in business, they, they happen faster. And so, as you said, you know, listening to the consumer today, it's probably more important than ever. It's always been important. Yeah, it's always been important, but uh, I, I mean, these are the people who pay more, our bills, you know? Yeah, but they there was pay a time it was more top-down, and now what I love particularly is that the consumer decides everything. They make yes. or break you in a second, Completely. right? Completely, which is amazing. It's very empowering for the consumer, and it's thrilling if you are somebody who wants to please people, whether you're a brand, a retailer, a storyteller. Um, a human if, being. A human <laughs> being, exactly. If you care about other people, uh, the consumers are other people. So, It's very interesting because I had this question much more down the line, but I'm going to ask you now. It's, you use a lot in your talking and interviews in general words like mind-blogging, the power of togetherness, uh, the power of self, the power of an idea, and I love the idea of putting power with emotion and power with humanity, you know, and caring. And I don't want to sound trite here, but um, can, you, can you express that a little bit? Uh, because I also believe that business has to be creative and business has to be good. Mm -hmm. And I will always tell people, don't even do it if you don't want to do good as much. So can you give me your... Well, I believe in the power of balance and yin and yang. Um, you know, uh, when, if you want to be specific about business, it has to work. It has to function, it has to make money, um, but it also has to make people dream, whether it's the people who work for you or the people who um, give you money, who, who participate in whatever business that you have. And um, I think that uh, you know, business without imagination doesn't move forward. And, but likewise, uh, imagination without the business know-how, without the systems, uh, also doesn't tend to move forward. Um, I think, um, you know, overall, it's about balance, whether it's in yourself as a, as a person, as a leader, uh, as a, a parent, um, or uh, an organization has to be in balance. And um, I think we're, in the industry, in the world today, we're, 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 we're looking for that balance. And I think, I'm hoping that we don't go from one extreme to the other. I think we need to be in the middle and balanced. Are we looking for that? Do you think the industry is? Well, I think if you, if you look at uh, gender, if you look at uh, creativity plus business, if you look at um, uh, diversity, uh, every, I think we are starting to be balanced. And, take in, and it goes back to taking in multiple points of view, listening mm -hmm. to the people, the consumer. Um, the minute you open up your hearing to hear different perspectives, um, you start getting a balanced view. So I'm optimistic. That's very good. I am too. I also, but I also think that the fashion industry in particular has been very slow in, people say they've been slow in adapting to the internet. I think they are slower in accepting that. Uh, a commentary or an idea can come from somewhere outside of your company. Well, listen, you know, we've, we've, um, I, it was a thrilling, thrilling time to be in the fashion industry. And um, I think we will all look back in those days as like, these magical days of the kingdom. And um, people, we had to blow the doors open. Um, and you know, some people are sad for the fact that uh, it's no longer a very private world of the fashion industry and that it's um, been opened up the way it is. And people get nervous about change. And I think That's you have to embrace thing. change. And um, change doesn't have to be bad. No, I couldn't agree more. But what do you think, 
what do you think will happen with all those people that are still afraid? I mean, the fashion industry still has what I call the dinosaurs, managers that they're holding on to their power and their comp I'm not mentioning names, but some of the brands are not doing that well because of that. And then you have other brands that embrace change and it's out there for everybody to see how incredibly right. well they're doing. So I wonder, do they understand, don't they, un or they're unable to accept the change? Well, I can't oh, speak for yeah. anybody else, but I think uh, change is good. And I always used to say um, uh, leaders in uh, organizations are experts in old ideas. Mm -hmm. And you know, I threw myself in that bucket as well. And when mobile came around and social came around, you know, I had to uh, you know, and ask, how does this work? Teach me. And um, even now, you know, with my kids, you listen to them. You know, the, 12-year-old uh, wisdom in the house. Yeah, and they know much better than we do how it works and what they want. Mm -hmm. And they do want now. The difference is also that young people do want things that maybe they're not accessible to them immediately, but they have an opinion, they have an idea, so they ask. Well, they don't have any limits. They don't have any limits. Um, so what next we know, we know that you've launched your imaginary venture and uh, I think I understood, you know, apart from again, the business side of it, what you want to do with it, but it would be nice to hear from you. So when, when you've been so successful to the point that you literally changed the system with your first venture, what can you want or expect or what's the next objective? Well, imaginary... Apart from making money, but that's a different thing. Or making money for your stakeholders. It's, it's, that's a byproduct. Yeah. But, um, uh, imaginary is a venture fund, and which I started with my business partner, Nick Brown. Mm -hmm. And um, we invest in uh, people with big ideas and big dreams and who want to disrupt retail and uh, direct-to-consumer brands. And in a way, um, it's... I'm empowering, hopefully empowering with mentoring and financial resources, the next generation of disruptors and who are very exciting and who inspire me as much as I, you know, they ask me to spend some time with them and, and, and give them practical operational lessons, but uh, really I'm the one who is uh, getting it's inspired. inspired. <laughs> and um, we believe that, uh, you know, every area in the consumer space could be disrupted unless companies listen to their customers and think about um, how to market to people, how to talk to them, how to, uh, the pro kind of products that they want, the, uh, the image they need to portray in order to stay relevant. So we're looking at businesses in the beauty space, in the wellness space, in grooming, in sports, in, in apparel. Um, and uh, I think that you know, the thrill of what I experienced building a business is uh, carries on with helping others uh, experience that thrill and um, go out and do point. amazing things. So, and also, as in my past life as a multi-brand retailer, I spent a lot of time identifying, you know, the hot shoe brand, the hot denim brand, the beauty brand, men's grooming, uh, men's sneaker brand. And you know, out of a world of choices and curating that. Um, so I think a, a venture capitalist is an editor, uh, is an editor, mm. yeah, who gives money. So, but <laughs> yeah, that's very good and mentoring. But um, so, how do you? So, do they come to you, or you scan the world? Both, of? both. We've, um, we've. Uh, I mean, when I left net porte I started getting phone calls from um, people who were starting businesses saying, listen, do you have five minutes to spend with me? Or five million. And, 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 or five million. <laughs> five minutes or five million. I was like, I'll give you 15 minutes. And, um, and then I realized that this was something that I really enjoyed doing. And then Nick has a, a track record of having invested in direct-to-consumer mm -hmm. brands for the last... Uh, almost decade, and uh, so we said, well, why don't we combine our, our skill sets and our worldview and um, start reaching out to people who are starting businesses. So it's a both, sometimes I'll hear about uh, somebody uh, who's doing something in you know, California, and we get on the phone and we call them up and we fly out there and say, this is, what are Amazing. you doing? Yeah. And, and sometimes they call us. I mean, it, 
it's, tell, it's exactly like being on the receiving end of you know, 200 brands a day calling and saying, please, can you look at my bikini brand because um, I'd like to be on your platform. And in a way, Imaginary is a platform for entrepreneurs. Yes, but the difference is that you take the risk of buying some stock that will you know, stay in the stock room forever, which is a financial risk, but here, you put money and time into people. something that, yeah, into people and, and a concept. they can make mistakes every day. So, uh, you know, we all know that if we're investing, we know that one time we win big and one time we lose big. So it's... Hope, yes. Hopefully not. Hopefully not. <laughs> anything can happen. But I wonder if Nick is the bottom line man and you're the guts person in it. You're the... Do you do you go with your guts feeling? Yeah, I mean, listen. Or we, you look at the figures. We both do. We both do. I, I honestly don't think there's any point in starting a business unless it's going to have revenue and it's going to be profitable. Mm. And I think you have to illustrate that from day one, that this is your vision for it. We're not, um, neither of us are interested in uh, financing somebody's uh whim of, of an idea without them having some very grounded uh, yeah. approach. I think that you, know, you can't confuse loving uh, creativity and style with not uh, having an eye for the bottom line. So that's the first thing that's required, people to show you they have a... You have to be serious. Sustainable future. Again, it's about balance. Yeah. They have to know how they're going to build a business uh, creatively. and and. And there are plenty of people doing it right now. It's really exciting to see what's going on. And, and do you take people out for lunch to see how they treat the waiter? For me, <laughs> I know it makes people laugh, but I think it's very important when you hire someone who believes in someone to see how they are. With other people? Yeah, Absolutely. with other people or how complicated they are in their choices of food. I think all of that shows you. I haven't gone to the complication in the choices of food. I think today, you know, you go to, you have a business meeting and everybody's ordering a very different variation on a coffee and a, a matcha yeah. latte and, 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 a, and, milks. <laughs> and different milks. Yes, exactly. Um, so I leave that out. Um, listen, I think the way that people treat other people is enormously important. How they interact with their team how they interact with uh, the world, um, how, and you know, this trickles down to customer service. Yeah, absolutely. But so, so you, another thing that I read about you, and I think I know you a little bit, is you know, the contentment and happiness and, and, and wanting to wake up and go somewhere and being happy to. So do you look, I mean, now you're not buying companies, but you know, investing in companies. Do you need to like the people that you're sitting at a board table with, do you need to say, oh, Listen, you can I, be my friend? You won't be because... I mean, but. I like 99.999% of people. So I have to park that as one of the That's judgment a very good things. quality. Yeah, I mean, I just, I, 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 I tend to like everybody. So um, I think that uh, obviously a person has to be, in order to be a leader, in order to attract an amazing team who wants to work for you tirelessly in order to attract investors, to keep them uh, believing in your vision even through the dark times. Uh, somebody who's going to go out and negotiate deals, they have to have some magic quality. Mm -hmm. and, um, and most of the founders that we get inspired by and that we invest in have these uh, incredible qualities and it's not everybody who's going to do it but mm. they are um, they have to have that at the base and you can tell quite immediately right mostly yeah although you know you can have a very introverted leader who is uh, enormously successful so it's can't but with a great vision with a great vision mm. and a great execution plan yeah, that's very important. We can go back to that. And um, so uh, this is less optimistic and positive, but, you know, in business, there's the, the, the split, the heartbreak, the fear of failure. The, and, I'm, and I'm talking about all of this because I know our kind of audience and I know they will take it as advice. But, you know, you obviously went through a moment where it wasn't a happy place anymore to be. And I'm not 
interested in details, but how do you deal with that? How do you wake up one day and say, you know what, I'm a strong person, I have a life ahead of me, let's change it, let's leave, let's quit. And it's your baby, in a way, you know, so... Well, it's not my baby. Um, it's a business that I started. And um, I think that, uh, listen, for me, I, I believe that um, you have to believe in yourself, first and foremost, and you have to treat yourself the way you hope other people treat. would treat you. Yeah. And uh, you have to be kind with yourself. And if a situation is not the right thing, um, you have to make a decision on your own behalf. And um, I also believe in not having fear and making decisions um, based on passion and uh, a, a belief in the future, not in a fear of holding on to the past. And I had to say to myself, um, do I believe that I have more to give, um, that I have an exciting future? And that is yes. And, um, and I'm enormously proud of what we built. And, and, and now I can do many more things. So in a way, it's um, that believing in the future has allowed me to do this today. Yeah, that's a very, very good point, very important. And it is inspiring, actually. <laughs> um, so then, OK, so door open when, when you decided to change, and apart from imaginary ventures, which is probably the most important, but there's the Farfetch co-chair um, co yeah. of Farfetch. I'm co-chairman of Farfetch with Jose Neves. Yes. Who's an inspiring Who is the smartest well. person I've ever met in my life. Oh, really? Yeah, he, he's a genius. He's a genius. I mean... Isn't he a mathematician originally or, he's or a, a scientist, he's right? A, he's everything. Mm. He's really um, inspiring. And um, I was delighted when he called and said, hey, let's have a conversation. And he said, yes. I said, yes. Um, listen, I believe in, again, this is a continuation of the journey that I started in 1999 and how to disrupt and how to uh, serve the customer and, and the brands in, in, a, in a great way. And um, in the years ago, actually even before Jose had called, um, I looked at what the future of the customer experience would be. And it was very clear to me in the age of Uber and last mile delivery mm. and having you know, everything that you want at your fingertips within minutes, um, that we were going to have to change the way that we worked. And also there was a very worrying time where the brands in the fashion industry had empty stores. And with the empty stores came markdowns, came uh, uh, what I viewed as a devaluing of the beauty of those brands. And, um, and I thought, if we're going to be true partners to those brands, we need to help them sell the beautiful product that is in those stores. And how can we connect that product with the consumer? Not just the product in three distribution centers, but the product all over the world. And it became clear that um, there was a company out there that was doing this, and that was Farfetch. And they had connected every single multi-brand boutique in the world with all of that beautifully curated product into one central database that the consumer could access from anywhere in the world and had started very quietly connecting all the brands as well into the platform. And I thought, well, that's just going to take us years and years and years to do um, the, the tech platform that uh, underscores uh, and mm -hmm. has built Farfetch is extraordinary. And, um, and so I thought, well, maybe we should merge with Farfetch. Um, so you know, a couple years later, when Jose called and said, hey, do you, um, are you interested in talking about this business model? And, and I said, Jose, I think you have the winning business model. And it would be my honor. So he called you immediately after you left Netta Porter. He didn't call you to merge. Oh no! I, this was this was, was a after, long time yeah. after. Yeah, yeah, no, I was, uh, you know, enjoying my free time. That's great. <laughs> yeah, you had this post-it saying I, say no. I had a post-it on my computer screen. I mean, I still have it because I say yes all the time. Um, <laughs> but uh, I had a post-it note that said uh, just say no, because uh, also when you're not working. And it was really a treat to take uh, some time off after 15 years of sitting at my desk, um, which was incredible. But you know, it was amazing to just whoosh, take a break. Um, 
you don't have any reason to say no. So people You've say, hey, time. are you free next Tuesday for like a three hour meeting? You're like, uh, yes, yes. <laughs> I am. And, and I can't wait to meet So then you say yes. And then actually you end up being really busy, like busier than you've ever been because you're saying yes to everybody. So then I was like, okay, post it note. Just say Put no. it on the computer, say no. But I, there's one thing that I learned is sometimes when I see someone or you know people call me at a different level but to see something and sometimes I'm like oh I know it's going to be a waste of time and then oh yes you find a pearl yeah. you find something that will change your next oh, yeah. six months so synchro I'm destiny quite open. exactly I'm quite I believe open in it to completely me too. no I'm completely open I sometimes just say okay there's a reason why I'm going here why I'm doing this and I don't know what it is yet and then um, and more. then of course you find out and you go aha that's why I'm here Fantastic. Uh, Let's go back to Farfetch for a second. So your role is non-executive, right? Or you have exactly. non-executive powers? I have no, no executive powers. Um, so you're an advisor? You're... I, well, I'm uh, co-chair of the board of mm -hmm. directors uh, with Jose. We talk about the overall strategy, um, partnerships, um, and uh, next steps. And so what's the next disruption possible? In this I, industry, in the fashion industry? Yeah, I don't think that you can get more disruptive than what Jose is doing uh, in terms of connecting every uh, piece of product uh, out there. And he's not done. I mean, it's still such early days. Um, I think that uh, there's just a continued uh, evolution of, if you look at what Farfetch is doing in terms of powering this ability for creators and curators to reach their audience, then you look at what else will the creators want to do and will they want to do customization? Will they want to do product just for you? Um, will you want product just for you? And how, how can a, a platform uh, facilitate that? And um, what uh, is inspiring is that there are actually virtually no limits. And, mm. and it is very exciting to watch. That's great. Um, so, what about being the chairwoman of the British Fashion Council? What was um, that about? What okay, so I spent five years um, working alongside Caroline Rush, who's the yes. CEO of the BFC. And uh, I remember I was just minding my own business, <laughs> had forgotten to put Again, the post-it note no. that said no. <laughs> And I started getting a couple calls, including from Anna Winter, mm -hmm. who said, Natalie, you've got to give back. <laughs> and I said, I know, I'm so busy. And she says, now's the time. You have to do something. And, um, and then Caroline Rush came back to see me and said, please, will you join us? And I said, I just have no time. And they were like, we, it won't take any time. And, uh, and so then I um, got very excited once I started because um, of the creativity that we have in the UK and London, in London. Yeah. And, um, and then really just some lessons that I'd learned along the way about the balance between creativity and business, um, the importance of technology and adapting to change, the importance of having a business plan and thinking of the fashion uh, industry, not as just fashion, but fashion business, and um, the importance of projecting your brand on a global scale and uh, not just talking to the local press, but the international press, and using platforms like Instagram and Facebook to reach people who oh. could uh, be part of your brand. And um, so it was really gratifying to be able to take some of the lessons that I had learned and um, kind of put it down and have conversations with the, the extraordinary talents that we have here in the UK and say, these are some tools that have come in handy. Um, please use these. And over the course of the last five years, we've seen an explosion, uh, not just in creativity, but in sustainable businesses where uh, designers have their own name above their door in their own shops. Um, if they wholesale their business, it's because they choose to, not because they have to. They have e-commerce. They are savvy marketers in their own rights. They don't depend on third parties just to um, tell the story about their brands. And I think uh, we're going to see over the next 50 years uh, that the early investments that were made uh, over this last six, seven years in uh, thinking about the space differently are going to pay off. And are they succeeding? All these uh, young uh, English brands that we all love, but 
my friends not in the fashion industry say, do they really sell? And I don't know, they I do? don't have access to figures anymore. So I mean, I can tell I you, you wonder. find out very quickly if they're, if they're struggling because they can't sustain they a business. But if they're here, you have to realize that this is a generation of designers that uh, are not work working. If, if they work for another label, it's by choice. So if you look at uh, Jonathan, uh, JW, um, you know, he very much chose to do Lueve, but also with an eye of having his own brand. Mm -hmm. And a decade earlier, the only way that you could succeed in fashion was to take this extraordinary talent and plug it into someone else's organization. Today, they're building their own organizations. And even if those organizations are small, they are independent, they are uh, able to be exactly what their customer wants. They don't have to be all things to all people. I think it's okay to be own one category and or two categories. You don't have, not everyone has to have beauty and lipsticks and luxury handbags. You can, just make beautiful dresses. Yes, more and more. Right? So I there think... Many girls who are doing that. I think they are succeeding. That's good. I mean, I, and I love what we see in London every year, and I think probably it's the most honest way of, of doing fashion, because I don't think there are many young people here that are appropriating, which is this word that we use very much now instead of coping. Right. <laughs> and, and I think London is inspiring for that. And they're not just being seen here in London, they're being seen around the world. Yeah. If you walk the, the multi-brand boutiques and the department stores, and again, thanks to uh, internet companies, you know, not just Farfetch, but all, all of them, they, they're being exposed to a global client yeah. base. And do you, do you um, will you stay very much in the fashion industry? I mean, is it your eyes in that direction more than in, you know, beauty or no, lifestyle I, or? I think that I am interested by so many other things mm -hmm. than fashion. I mean, I am obsessed with technology. I'm obsessed with media. Um, I do, you know, having started Mr. Porter, I'm also obsessed with men's uh, lifestyle. And uh, I'm interested in everything that is, uh, that touches the consumer and why a consumer buys something and why all of a sudden when they hadn't considered something they wanted. How does that message spread like wildfire? How, how is one brand hot and the other not, even though they're doing very different things? What are the subtleties? Those things really excite me. And um, within that space, uh, Imaginary is looking at uh, apparel companies, I would say. I don't necessarily call them fashion, um, but these are companies that are making clothing for women uh, that are rethinking the space. Um, Good American out of mm. Los Angeles uh, said, why does designer denim have to come in small sizes? And um, have uh, launched a range from size zero to size 24 US. They single-handedly re, um, redefined what it means to have a designer brand. On the designer floor, they worked with Nordstrom's across the United States, who then turned around and told them, you've changed our view of how we treat this customer and they've uh, changed the mannequins in the stores, and things, things like that. Uh, we've also invested in a company called Universal Standard, which mm -hmm. said, why do plus size women have to uh, wear clothes that are not fashionable again? Uh, how do we treat them uh, with, res treat this client's segment with respect? I mean, I'd love to see the entire fashion industry add an, you know, 10 sizes up. Well, why say no to customers? I think they will, because thanks of these people that have started it, they will realize... It's a conversation I've been there. having for uh, 15 years, and, um, and I'm, happy, I'm happy to see the change. Yeah, finally. And uh, let's go back for a second to content. Um, I remember when Style.com launched, uh, I was reading interviews of people saying, oh my God, this can only be the greatest success of all because Condé Nast is on the content and then it didn't work. And uh, it was pretty soon obvious that there was a problem there. So my question is, first, is content still, I mean, if we all know that one of the things you brought to it was, you know, giving women content on not only product, but is it still, does it still matter and why didn't it work? We condensed. Well, I think that uh, Style.com was a 
brilliant idea. And, uh, and I think that uh, had they done it in 2000, 2002, 2005, um, I think they really would have uh, dominated. Be because uh, to have started uh, in that space earlier would have uh, meant uh, less of an investment. Um, if you're going to go into the space today, you're talking about a huge addressable market. Um, and so you need to be ready with a lot of inventory, a lot of logistics. Um, it's, uh, a lot you know, of money. when I started, there were three women looking online, you know, using Yahoo saying, can I buy some fashion online? So, you know, easy for us to grow with the market. We created the market, we grew with the market, and um, uh, able to make our mistakes quietly. Uh, today, you know, anyone who would enter that space, I mean, it's like, who's going to start a, a, a competitor to Amazon today? I mean, you know, it's the time to have done that ha has gone by. Um, your question about content, uh, content is as important as ever. I mean, how much time do we all spend glued to our telephones and to our screens, looking at images, reading stories to each other, sharing them? Uh, it's just the medium has shifted and changed, but the content itself uh, is still there. But so, in a way, if I re-listen to what you just said, it's like the problem with style.com was that it happened at the wrong time, but you're investing in technological companies and don't they have the same problem? Or they're very different from what already exists? Um, listen, style.com uh, in its guise then could have succeeded, um, but it would have taken uh, many years and a lot of investment. And as you know, Farfetch came in and made an acquisition of style.com and uh, the assets. It's a brilliant domain, and we're very proud of uh, working in partnership with Condé Nast to power that content. And I think this is, again, back to Farfetch. I think what Farfetch does really well is it says, we're not shopkeepers, we're not brands. We're not designers, and we're not content creators. We power All the people who are very good at those things. Um, and the brands that are starting today are not necessarily platforms that are multi-brand retail platforms. These are people who are saying, OK, there are these platforms that can empower my brand to start, that can help me reach customers mm. like never before and grow my business faster than ever before, whether it's marketing platforms that allow you to put on a message and reach millions of people instantly around the world, or distribution platforms um, that allow you to ship from one location to the rest of the world. So the, the entrepreneurs that are starting businesses today are saying, how can I piggyback on this ecosystem, which is really uh, a perfect platform for me to start a business and start uh, subdividing it and creating niches and micro brands within mm -hmm. bigger spaces. So breaking apart the beauty industry and saying, I'm not going to create a beauty brand that's for everyone. I'm going to create a beauty brand that's for millennials, for women who don't want to wear makeup, like Glossier. Um, or I want to create a clean beauty brand for people who care about um, the, what they put on their skin. Um, instead of, I'm going to create a brand that every single person on the world is going to wear. So these micro Niche. brands are coming up fast and furious using what has been built over the last 20 years in terms of these very powerful platforms that can propel you out into the world. But so will they be as big or big doesn't, size doesn't matter anymore? I think what we're going to see is um, more, more businesses, profitable businesses, um, and maybe not as huge. Some of them will have the ambition to be all things to all people and, you know, good for them. And, yeah, exactly. uh, and then obviously that requires time and uh, careful uh, diversification. Uh, but I think a lot of businesses we're going to see are going to be very good at one thing. And because they can be aggregated on platforms, and now I'm talking about FMCG and, um, you know, beverages and uh, toiletries, you know, that can be aggregated on Amazon. You can create one vertical brand that is distributed around the world. It's, it's not just relegated to fashion or beauty. It's yeah, absolutely. the opportunity to do something and reach uh, and a, a broad customer and be a specialist is, is today. Which is very interesting because it, it, it's like a circle that circles back because again Always. in the 90s, you know, the big brands that were doing 
leather, then they became ready to wear and perfumes and so it was good. And I remember there was a time where the only specialist was Rolex, actually. Right. Everybody else had become a, you know. I mean, I say that and then lifestyle I'm, I'm going to go back on myself as well and just say that also, you know, when you are a fan of a brand, when you love that brand, when it defines you, um, when it tells the world who you are, sometimes you want that brand to start touching every part of your life. Um, but again, if you're if you're the creator of the brand and you're listening to your customer, if this is what they want, then you should go there. Yeah, it's, I was listening to it, and this is not about me, but I don't. <laughs> you don't want one brand to define no, you? No, yeah. I want the best in it. I mean, I want the in best. In every category. Yeah. I, no. Well, there's going to be a brand for you in every category coming soon. I count on you on yeah. that. So on this note, thank you very much. <laughs> well, it's been a pleasure. <laughs>